So, Harun and one of you have uh, logged in. Good morning to all of you. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Good morning. Morning. And as I always intimate you before uh, the class, well in time, expecting some of you at least to read up and come. We are discussing food poisoning today, which is not a disease or a communicable disease per se, but a collection of diseases, right? So food poisoning is a kind of a chapter by itself where we discuss certain uh, important uh, agents which cause almost similar symptoms, almost similar, because some of them are quite, quite acute and life-taking, whereas some of them are uh, something which me and you have got sometime in our uh, lives, perhaps, because of unhygienic food. Okay, so food poisoning, we are still in the intestinal diseases. It's an acute gastroenteritis. See, we talked about diarrhea. This is also a type of diarrhea and vomiting caused by ingestion of food or drink contaminated with either living bacteria or their toxins or inorganic chemical substances and poisons. So there are three things. Either it's a bacteria or it's a toxin or it's a chemical. A chemical can be a poison or it can be something which is not suitable to our body. Food poisoning outbreaks are usually recognized by sudden occurrences of group of illnesses within a short period of time among individuals who have consumed one or more foods in common. Please remember the definitions of each and every disease as we go along the communicable diseases chapter. I tell every class that before the actual chapter starts, the problem statement starts, there is a small paragraph on top of every letter or of every chapter, which gives you in a gist perhaps the whole uh, uh, information about the disease, including a sort of definition. And as our science teachers taught us in class 12 or class 10, we have to open our answers with a definition. So please remember to include all the important points in a definition. In this case, as we say, it's a gastroenteritis caused by a bacteria or by substances which are inorganic or by poisons, okay? Food poisoning outbreaks are usually recognized by sudden, okay? There's a sudden occurrence of a group of illness. So sudden group within a short period of time, okay? So it can be a, a very uh, small uh, or, or a short incubation period and one or more foods are consumed by uh, a common group of people who fall in. That, that part we all know. But sudden occurrences, short period of time, bacteria or toxins or poisons, all these things need to be added by you to make a complete definition. So, to summarize, there's a history of ingested common food. Persons attacked many together, okay? So many people are attacked together. If you and your friends partake in a meal or a feast or somebody's, you know, party, majority of you will fall in. And there is similarity in signs and symptoms in majority of cases. So these are the three important things in the definition. So if you have understood the definition, the rest of the problems, the rest of the chapter becomes a little easier. Unsafe food containing harmful bacteria, viruses, parasites, and chemical substances cause more than 200 diseases. And we are going to discuss only about six here, ranging from diarrhea to even cancers. Imagine, an estimated 600 million, almost one in 10 people in the world, fall ill after eating contaminated food, and about 4.2 lakh die each year resulting in loss of 33 million healthy life years. So many young people, many people who are in the productive years of their life are dying because of certain things in the food. So food bone diseases, or as we can say, uh, diseases caused because of some bacteria, viruses or parasites or chemicals, oblique poisons in a food can cause so many, uh, so much of morbidity and deaths. Dietary diseases are the most common illnesses resulting from the consumption of contaminated food and uh, 550 million fall ill and about 2.3 lakhs die every year. So in the previous uh, slide, we had seen that about 600 million because of all types of uh, you know, harmful things in the food, 
whereas diarrhea, out of these diarrheal diseases, take a chunk, 550. See, out of 600, about 550 million people die because of diarrheal diseases. Under fives carry about 40% of the foodborne disease burden with 1.25 lakh deaths by all these figures. We are not supposed to remember, it's humanly impossible, but it's just to show to you that the kind of uh, harm uh, foodborne diseases can cause. About 110 US, 110 billion US dollars is lost each year in productivity and medical expenses resulting from unsafe food in low and middle income countries, right? So imagine the, 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 uh, the extent of the problem. Types, very easy, there are two types, bacterial, non-bacterial. The non-bacterial contains the chemicals, the fertilizers, such as arsenic, pesticides, cadmium, mercury, all these are harmful chemicals. And the bacterials are the salmonella, staphylococci, botulism, clostridium perfringens, and bacillus cereus. We will deal with each one of these important ones subsequently. Epidemiology. Food poisoning may occur as a result of eating any one of the following. Substances containing specific poisons like fungi, amantia, am amanita, phyloids, instead of edible mushroom. Okay. Sometimes we buy mushrooms from the market. We should be very careful. Food contaminated by poisons. Substances containing poisons. Substances contaminated by poisons. There are two different things. Due to agriculture or industrial activities, fertilizers and pesticides are applied. Many of the time we read in the newspapers that some apples are coated with wax. Some fruits are ripened fast by some chemicals, not to buy them. Even the fruit vendors on the roadside will display a kind of a printout saying that no chemicals used. So foods contaminated by poisons and foods infected with harmful organisms like salmonella, clostridium or staph. Okay. So food poisoning, we, we are repeating this actually from the definition we are elaborating a little bit is caused because of ingestion of either some specific poisons like in a mushroom we said or foods contaminated with poisons many a time the fruits and foods infected with organisms, namely the three important ones, Salmonella, Clostridium, and Staph. The commonest, the commonest epidemiological pattern of this disease is sharp and short explosive outbreaks. Okay, so sharp and short. Short means it's of a short duration. I eat the food now within hours or within a day or within two days. I get these symptoms, okay? And the symptoms are quite acute. So that is sharp, mainly in close community eating organizations. Like I told you, we go to a party, all of us are friends. So we are a close community. We are a cohort, like students' hostels, old people's homes, but sometimes even in hotels and restaurants, especially when canned meat is used. And milk preparations are made from pooled milk. So milk, meat, these are the common culprits. And we have often... Uh, heard news of some uh, hostels having a lot of people falling ill or an orphanage where a lot of people, a lot of small children partook in a, in a feast and fell ill, okay? And God forbid, some of them die. Therefore, rarely do such outbreaks occur in household cooking. What your mother cooks and what I cook in the house, rarely such outbreaks happen because there are a limited number of people having the food and we prepare it with utmost care and hygiene. And these are mostly seen during festive occasions where large gatherings partake in the meal. So I need not elaborate on this. All of you know about festivities in India. We love to partake in feasts. Outbreaks are common when the environmental temperature is high, especially the summers or right now when it is quite humid. Foods get spoiled very soon and we don't, we, we prepare something in the morning and we keep it till the evening for consumption. And that's when the bacteria flourish in the food. So we start with Salmonella. Now each of these are given in some paragraphs in your book. I have tried to take out the gist of all this. You just have to remember the important points because in case food poisoning comes as a short note, you have to write it in a quick, short fashion, touching upon all the important ones. Whereas if it comes as a long question or a part of the long question, you can elaborate. So it can come as both, right? Extremely common, Salmonella. And it is seen in communal feeding, increase in international trade in human food. The other day, I remember there was a politician feeding some migrants or some people who are 
going away because of the uh, recent virus uh, a, a pandemic and a lot of people fell ill in some village okay so therefore it can it can happen and it is happening higher incidence in farm animals widespread use of household detergents interfering with sewage treatment and wide distribution of prepared foods so we all know the reasons why there is an extremely common incidence of salmonella food poisoning because of increase in feasts increase in international trade we are getting foods from the west in our country we are exporting our foods to other countries and we are using a lot of farm animals a lot of household detergents which come into the sewage uh, uh, cycle the agent there are about 2500 serotypes of salmonella the species most commonly incriminated in human outbreaks is salmonella typhimurium please remember this salmonella typhimurium others are salmonella enteritidis cholera sewis and sunai okay so there are four types but if you write typhimurium i think you deserve maximum marks source primarily disease of animals man gets infected from farm animals and poultry why because you touch them and then you don't follow what we are now strictly following i hope hand hygiene or hand washing uh, practices rats and mice contaminated through their feces and urine rats and mice are that's why dangerous we know that rats have spread a lot of diseases when there are floods with their urine dust water manure sewage sludge vegetables insects birds fish etc they are all a part of the ecological cycle and they create havoc <coughs> because they harbor salmonella temporary human carriers contribute to the problem me and you are temporary carriers but we primarily get it from animals whether farm animals poultry rats mice or birds fish you know we can get it from them and of course all this thing comes in the sewage cycle because of poor hygiene so ingestion of contaminated foods and drinks causes salmonella food poisoning the reservoir is intestinal tract i need, need not elaborate incubation period as you say in this case is about half a day to one day remember as we go along the lesson and discuss the various types of food poisoning you will find the incubation period vary therefore i suggest that you write it down on a piece of paper in front of you and look it up before you come for the exam because each of these have different incubation periods and it's humanly very difficult to remember mechanism of action organisms multiply in the intestine of the uh, after ingestion of the food and give rise to acute enteritis and colitis there is pain and there is vomiting clinically any of the three syndromes enteric fever salmonella gastroenteritis or septicemia with focal lesions can happen the last one is the most dangerous so there are three syndromes it can be typhoid it can be just a gastroenteritis or it can be septicemia with focal lesions mortality is very low 1% but in case one is not careful one goes into septicemia it is difficult to revive convalescent carrier state lasts seven weeks so i have tried to make it concise if you see the agent the source the reservoir that is the host you can say in a way environment factors remain common i am talking about the epidemiology epidemiology also includes the incubation period and how the organisms multiply in the in intestine and give rise to the acute gastroenteritis there are three types of syndromes enteric fever gastroenteritis or septicemia now gastroenteritis as i said is the most common and after about 48 hours or 24 to 48 hours it causes nausea headache vomiting profuse watery diarrhea we have just read about typhoid okay the previous day and i am sure your memories are all very fresh about what kind of uh, fever and what kind of diarrhea we have in typhoid vis a vis cholera low grade fever most infections are mild but as i said severe ones may lead to dehydration and shock and multi organ failure generally it resolves it resolves in about 2 to 3 days but loose stools may remain for a few weeks lab investigations of blood cultures which are generally negative so stool is the uh, thing to be cultured right so that's all about salmonella i have not talked about the treatment and the prevention because we will take it up in a common uh, paragraph in the end now we all know that all these diseases are different so they have got their specific antibiotics all those things you have, must have read in medicine or you will read 
So you will have to add a line or two about the specific antibiotic. Rest of the preventive measures remain the same. Staph is as common as salmonella. The agent are enterotoxins of certain strains of coagulase positive staph aureus. There are five different toxins identified. One or more may exist. And the worst part is they are heat resistant. So this is because of toxins. The previous one because of multiplication. Source, ubiquitous in nature. Skin, nose, throat of man and animals. The harbor, the staff, foods like salads, custards. That's why we say that when you have cut vegetables or fresh vegetables which you can consume, like salads, you must wash them very, very thoroughly. Right? Custards, milk and milk products are the most common causes of staph food poisoning or staphylococcal food poisoning. Just remember the subtle differences between salmonella, which we discussed, and staph, because these are the two most common things that affect me and you. Incubation period is one to eight hours. If you see that there's a toxin, the incubation period is drastically reduced from one day to two days in um, uh, the st uh, staph thing, uh, in the uh, uh, st salmonella thing, this has come down to about eight hours. That is about one third of a day. That is quite quickly. And the mechanism of action is because of toxins, which are preformed in the food in which bacteria have grown. And they act directly on the intestines and, God forbid, the central nervous system. So these are called as intradietetic toxins. They are heat resistant and remain in food long after the organisms have died. Please appreciate, you may heat the food, but they may not kill the toxins. They may not destroy the toxins. So therefore, the toxins are the culprits here, and they are therefore more dangerous than the salmonella food poisoning. Clinically, there is sudden vomiting, okay, one to eight hours, sudden vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, there can be dysentery, blood and mucus in severe cases. But the typical feature is, unlike the previous one, there is no fever, and death again is uncommon. God has been kind. Well... The salmonella and the staph, you must have heard before, and they must be common names ringing in your ears. But botulism is something which we generally don't see, but we have to discuss. This is more serious because the case fatality rate is almost about 70%. But thankfully, it is a rare kind of food poisoning. In infants, it is called as infant botulism. Latin word botulus, meaning sausage, is from where we derive the name of this food poisoning. Clostridium botulinum. Type A, B, or E is the agent. Source are the soil, dust, and intestine of animals. So soil, dust, and intestines of animals harbor the uh, bacteria. The, it enters the food as spores. Now again, spores are dangerous because sometimes they can't be destroyed by the normal cooking methods that we use. Bone preserved and bottled foods like vegetables, smoked fish, and cheese are the most common culprits of Clostridium botulinum food poisoning. And as you can see, the incubation period is again from one to one and a half days, and therefore we can expect Clostridium poisoning to happen in a day. Toxin performed in food, which acts on the parasympathetic nervous system, is the, uh, is the important thing to note here. We also said in the previous food poisoning that there was a toxin. Again, these are intradietetic toxins, which are thermolabile. Thankfully, the previous one was heat resistant, the staph one, but this one is thermolabile. And eating food to about 100 degrees for a few minutes before consumption does prove effective. The symptoms almost remain the same, except for the fact that in case there is severe uh, Clostridium botulinum poisoning, the uh, signs and symptoms like dysphagia, diplopia, blurring vision, process dysarthria, muscle weakness, and even quadriplegia may occur. I told you in the previous slide that it affects the CNS, right? The previous thing. It affects the CNS because toxins have an affinity for the central nervous system. Similarly, this also affects your parasympathetic nervous system and produces symptoms which are of the nervous system, like ptosis, blurring vision, diplopia, all of the eyes, dysarthria, muscle weakness, and even quadriplegia. Again, like staff, the fever is not present, consciousness is retained, 
and frequently it is fatal because I told you the case fatality rate is almost 65 to 70 percent due to cardiac or respiratory failure. The antitoxin, I am discussing this here because in the prevention we have only we have kept a paragraph for antibiotics. Antitoxin 50,000 to 1 lakh units IV before the toxin fixes to the nervous tissue is supposed to be given. So you are supposed to diagnose this quite early. Guanidine hydrochloride reverses neuromuscular block. Active immunization with botulinum toxoid is available. Probably not feasible because you, you just don't know when you're going to get it. But then we have to have the antitoxin ready in case you are expect, suspecting a case of botulinum poisoning. Clostridium perfringens, okay? The agent is Clostridium perfringens, so well shy. The source is feces of man and animals, right? Soil, water, and air. Soil and water, obviously, they're contaminated by us because of our feces and by the animals. And, of course, the air also has the Clostridium uh, agent because it floats around. Ingestion of meat and poultry causes a disease that is non-vegetarian. Prior cooked food, 24 hours, cooled slowly at room temperature, and then again heated immediately before serving, causes the clostridium perfringens food poisoning. Please remember, when we cook food and we are not going to consume it, we refrigerate it, right? Don't keep it in the open, especially in summers or the pre-monsoon season because of the increased heat and humidity. And the food will get spoiled and probably even agents like clostridium will affect it. So therefore, we need to keep it in a refrigerator and heat it nicely and properly before eating the next day. The incubation period here is about a day. So again, it's quite confusing. One is one to eight hours, one is uh, 12 to 24 hours, one is, uh, you know, up to about a day. So you can remember these incubation periods by writing approximately one day or something like that. But remember, it can happen even in the first six hours after consumption. Again, we are talking about spores, like we talked about in botulism, right? We had toxins here, and we had toxins here. And we had the bacteria in this one, salmonella. So here we have spores, right? Spores, they survive cooking. And if cooked meat and poultry are not cooled enough, they germinate to produce toxins. So here the spores are rough and tough and they can, uh, they can resist a lot of heat unless the heat is about 100 degrees, as we said. And once the spores survive, they give out the toxin. The previous two also dealt with, we dealt with toxins. Clinically, there is almost similar kind of symptoms. There is diarrhea and abdominal cramps, slight or no fever, except for the first one, okay, which was... Salmonella, we have no fever in the others. And nausea and vomiting in this is rare. So it's more of a diarrhea, less of an enteritis. One day or less duration, as we told you, the, the whole thing lasts for about a day and there is rapid recovery without fatality. So up to now, we have seen that botulism is the most fatal. The rest of them, if managed on t in time, are not fatal or the person can survive and recover soon. We come to bacillus cereus food poisoning, a little rare, but we've got to read it. Bacillus cereus is aerobic, spore-bearing, motile, gram-positive rod, and produces two preformed stable enterotoxins. So again, we are dealing with toxins. Except for the first one, we have again come to toxins here. The, the two types of toxins can be emetic and dial. Okay, there are two types of toxins. One is the emetic form of toxin, and one is the diarrheal form of toxin. Source is almost the same. So the soil or the raw, dried, processed foods, they contain bacillus cereus. The incubation period of the emetic form is slightly faster. That is one to six hours. Whereas the diarrheal form is about half a day to one day, 12 to 24 hours. The mechanism of action is the spores, the survive your cooking, they germinate rapidly at favorable temperature. So we need to heat the food very, very thoroughly. Technically, emetic form, upper GI tract symptoms, like the staph food poisoning, and diarrheal form is more of lower GI symptoms, like the clostridium perfringens, okay? So in staph form, we have more vomiting. It starts with vomiting. Sometimes we don't even have diarrhea. Similarly, in bacillus serious emetic form, 
we have more of vomiting. And in the diarrheal form, we have got more of diarrhea. Well, investigation of food poisoning. So we have covered staph, staphylococcal food poisoning, Clostridium perfringens, Bacillus cereus, and botulism. Please remember, they are in short uh, uh, formats in your book, but you got to take out one of the important points which distinguish each from the other when you write in the exam. In case you write in a in a in a common collective way, things don't uh, you know gel well with the examiner because he you know he knows you can't distinguish. But investigation of food poisoning, the steps remain the same. And if you have remembered the investigations of an epidemic from your chapter in epidemiology, you will also be able to appreciate how to investigate a case or cases of food poisoning. Line listing of people, that is you make a list of people who are ill and detailed history taking, like we are doing in case of COVID. When somebody tests positive, we line list the contacts and we take a detailed history of all the people who came in contact with the patient or with the positive person. Similarly, in case we have an outbreak of food poisoning, 20, 30 people affected, we have to line list them, that is write their names, addresses, and that is we have to go about in an organized manner and take a detailed but quick history. And I'm sure most of them or all of them will point out to a common source. Question is, we have to make and we have to also interview the people in the dining hall or the food handlers, right? Lab investigations to incriminate causative agent, but also to determine the total number of bacteria, stools, and food handlers. Animal experiments, easier said than done in botulism. Blood for antibodies for retrospective diagnosis. So these are all lab investigations. Well, we come down to ecological studies, which we did also in the investigation of an epidemic. We got to inspect the eating and the cooking areas, the sanitation, the hygiene, and we also inspect the areas around and to see if there is any drain or sewage mixing or if the water supply has got some admixing with the sewage line. Data analysis is something which we do after collecting the data, and you need to do it for any epidemic, including food poisoning, time, place, person distribution, case control studies, and all these things you have remembered from your previous chapter. So write a line or two about the investigation of food poisoning. In case you remember some points from the investigation of, it, of an epidemic, you can add them in the investigation of food poisoning. Prevention and control. Lastly, we come down to prevention and control. And these are common steps for all the five or six important things that we discussed. Okay, food sanitation. We need to inspect meat, the, the meat before it is, before the, uh, before the animal is slaughtered is actually supposed to be inspected by a veterinary surgeon. And after the slaughter, he's supposed to certify the meat as healthy. Many a time you will read in the newspapers or see in the news that GHMC people have raided a shop, meat shop, and they have uh, confiscated, uh, you can say, uninspected mutton or, you know, stuff like that from a shopkeeper because they are supposed to only sell, buy and sell inspected meat. Personal hygiene of people handling the food, food handlers, your personal hygiene, food handling techniques. Nowadays, most of the food is handled by no touch technique, okay? Because we have got machinery, we have got the technology, and many people can afford it. They have become affordable. Sanitary imp improvements, especially in a slaughterhouse, you will find blood, offal, everything out there. Where are they being stored? Where are they being disposed of? Are they being disposed of properly? Is the drainage okay or is it choked? All these things you need to see and inspect. When you become medical officers and you are in charge of a hostel, You've got to inspect the food houses in a regular fashion, right? And also educate the food handlers and the others who are serving food and everything about the kind of hygiene they are supposed to maintain and the sanitation of the cooking area and the serving area and the eating area so that the food poisoning episodes don't happen. Refrigeration is very, very important because we don't consume all the food we cook even in our house immediately. So therefore, in bacterial food poisoning, uh, cook and eat, uh, we, we need to uh, prevent bacterial food poisoning by refrigerating the food. So once we keep it in lower temperatures, like we keep vaccines, the contamination is not there. We must follow the cook and eat same day golden rule, which our, which our predecessors used to follow. Every day your grandfather or somebody will go to the market, 
buy something that will be cooked and that will be consumed he will he'll go the next day but today our our, our fathers are we don't have much of time we, we 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 market for a whole week or two weeks and keep the stuff in the fridge and we eat it uh, by and by so it's not cook and eat the same day principle 10 to 49 degrees centigrade is a danger zone for bacterial growth remember we got to keep the food below 10 surveillance should be carried out regularly by concerned authorized and um, concerned authorities food samples and lab analysis of these food samples need to be taken in case there is an episode of food poisoning and you are the investigating officer please remember you got to keep food samples of the food consumed many a time the people will say we have washed away the utensils but you got to arrive before they have washed it or they have they must have heard about the episodes and they will immediately clear out the evidence so you got to collect the food samples collected in three three num three numbers of food samples are collected one is given to the uh, chap incriminated in uh, in the food uh, in in the preparation of food and he is supposed to keep it in his refrigerator one is supposed to be stored by you and one is supposed to be sent to a lab authorized to analyze the food under cold chain please remember the five keys to safe food are keep clean separate raw and cooked food cook thoroughly keep food at safe temperatures and use safe or potable water and raw materials whatever vegetables you buy ask your mother to wash them thoroughly sometimes in bleach keep food at safe temperatures what i mean to say is that some foods even if they are kept outside the room temperatures they are supposed to be kept in a cooler place okay cook thoroughly don't be in a hurry we must cook thoroughly especially non veg food non veg food separate the raw and the cooked food don't keep them together and always maintain your hand hygiene your personal hygiene and the sanitation of the place which is the kitchen as far as your house is concerned or a cook house as far as your hostel or a mess or a canteen is concerned right so we have done food poisoning and now i'll rush to the next chapter which is the last one in your intestinal group of diseases and that is the very important worms the soil transmitted helminths and the others we started a little late so we can afford to be a little late also group of diseases hook worms round worms whip worms right they are called as the sths or the soil transmitted helminths again a little confusing about their life cycle you got to recollect your microbiology knowledge again a little uh, confusing about the incubation period and how uh, how how uh, uh, they uh, they affect the human being but you as you go through the lesson you will recollect your previous knowledge and perhaps the things will become easy it's the most common worldwide worm infection right all these the soil transmitted helminths even perhaps me and you have suffered from it in childhood 24% of the world population that is about 2 billion is infected with worms more so in tropical subtropical and the third world countries like sub saharan africa the americas by that i mean the south americas china east asia and of course your own country india girls and adult women preschool and school children are the most vulnerable so children girls and adult women because they they are uh, working barefoot or something and they are neglected that's why they are most affected by the group of worms we come to hookworm any infection caused by ankylostoma duodenale or nicotera americanus single or mixed infection is called as a hookworm infection please remember hookworm is either ad or na ankylostoma duodenale or nicotera americanus or it can be both in in one it is almost eradicated in the advanced europe and the us but it is still seen in warm and moist climes like in our country between 45 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator and carostoma duodenale once upon a time was more in europe and southwest asia whereas nicotera was more in tropical africa and the americas but right now there is no rigid demarcation they have got admixed and they are they are they are found these worm infections are found all over the world in india ankylostoma duodenale is predominantly found in north india whereas nicotera americanus is mostly found 
in our south. Recently, there is a new ankylostoma called Coelanecum. Okay, perhaps from the word Ceylon. I'm not very sure which has been seen in Kolkata. However, rigid demarcation is no longer possible as I told you. They are widely distributed all over the world and all over India. You can't say he is in north, so he will get ankylostoma. It was once upon a time and there was some demarcation, dem demarcation, but right now it is not there. There are 460 million cases annually and about 3.2 million deaths which happen every year or years lost. Endemic index. Now this is something which is not given in the book. It was given in your previous edition and it has been taken out from the recent editions. I don't know why, but they still come in the exam. A short note comes on Chandler's index. If some of you have seen the soap serial called as friends, you will remember a guy called as Chandler. Well, it's the average number of eggs per gram of stew. So there's nothing great in remembering Chandler's index. You must write that it's the average number of eggs of the worm concerned. It doesn't concern only hookworm. It can be whipworm, it can be the other worms. Per gram of stew, if there are less than 200 eggs, hookworm infection is not of much significance. So perhaps mine and your stew also contains less than 200. If it is 200 to 250, it may be regarded as potentially dangerous. If it is 250 to 300, it is considered as a minor health problem, minor public health problem. But in case the Chandler's index crosses 300, it becomes an important public health problem. I'm sure in the underdeveloped parts of India, in urban slums and rural slums or rural areas, in, in unhygienic areas, in sp areas where the sanitation is not proper, Chandler's index would be more than 300. So it's an important index. Please note it down. At least write it down in, in a piece of paper and search for it somewhere later on and make your own notes in the book. This is not given in the book, I repeat. It's used in epidemiological studies to compare worm loads of different population groups. Also, degree of reduction of egg output after mass treatment is done by measuring the Chandler's index. So first of all, we compare the worm loads or we take an initial worm load and later on after mass treatment, we see how much of the worm load has come down. So it's an important index. Epidemiological determinants, aging factors, I've already told you. The adults live in the small intestine, especially jejunum, and they attach to the villi of the jejunum. The males are shorter, the females are longer. They are dorsally curved anterior. You see the diagrams in your microbio or in the other textbooks. And ankylostoma duodenale lays about 10 to 30,000 eggs per day, whereas the nicotine rate lays about a, a little less number, that is about five to 10,000 eggs per day. The eggs reach the soil, they hatch in one or two days, they form a larva. The larva molds two times to become skin penetrating third stage infective larva. Two molds, first stage, second stage. And when they mold the third time, they become infected. And that happens in five to 10 days. They lie in wait in the soil and the grass. And also in case you touch the soil and the grass and don't wash your hands and put the same hand in your mouth, you are infected through the oral route also. So therefore, they lie in wait in the soil and the grass to penetrate you. In the body, they migrate via the lymphatics and blood to lungs, reach alveoli. Finally, they reach the bronchi and the trachea, and they are cuffed up and swallowed to reach the small intestine. So they enter through your uh, skin, they, they enter through the lymphatics, go to the blood, come to your lungs, and then they are cuffed up to reach the gastrointestinal system and come to the small intestine where they sexually mature. And imagine they stay in your tummy for about one to four years. So this is an interesting life cycle. Please read about it. Sorry, please read about it and recollect your microbiology lessons. Reservoir is man, infected material, as I told you, is feces with ova, soil with infective larva. The feces uh, sends out the eggs, the eggs come to the soil and develop and become infected. Period of infectivity, as long as a person harbors the parasite, he is infected. Host factors, all ages, both sexes, 15 to 25 years of age, the most affected because they are outdoorish in nature. Nutrition, malnutrition, and iron deficiency are, uh, they, pro they make a person prone to worms or vice versa, right? Because of worm infestation, they become uh, uh, iron deficiency anemia patients or they have what? Malnutrition because the worms are eating the food that you ingest. There is something called as host parasite balance in endemic areas. Inhabitants, inhabitants develop a host 
parasite balance. The balance spelling is wrong, in which worm load is limited and the hosts harbor the parasite without clinical signs or symptoms. Something like this, which we are seeing in COVID. You may say that I'm obsessed with COVID, but all of us are. In COVID, you will find most of the patients are asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms, and yet they are coming out as COVID positive on testing. Similarly, there is a host parasite balance for this hookworm infestation in endemic areas, where in spite of harboring the worms, the patients don't exhibit any signs or symptoms. Occupation, mostly, as I told you, people who are outdoorish, that is agricultural workers, because they are barefoot, they tread the soil with, without chappals or without shoes, and therefore it's an occupational disease. The, the environmental factors, I need not elaborate. Imagine the environment in India or Hyderabad or any village, and you will come to know why hookworm uh, flourishes in such environment. Damp, sandy, decaying vegetation. Temperatures of about 24 to 32 degrees Celsius. Less than 13, no egg development. More than 50, the larvae are killed. So extremes of temperature are not important. But what temperatures we have in our tropical or subtropical climate is enough for these worms to live and multiply. They require oxygen, they require moisture, they require rainfall. The rainy season is coming. And they also love to stay in shade because direct sunlight kills the uh, larvae. The human habits need not be elaborated. I have already repeated them. Defecation, going barefoot, farming practices with untreated sewage, children wading or playing in infected mud, like they show in these advertisements in the TV about soaps or something. They think it is very cute, but actually they may cause worm infestation. And the social factors, uh, like the socioeconomic factors, are important in this case. Mode of transmission, you already know, skin penetration through the feet or oral route, incubation period, in case of uh, ankylostoma is unpredictable, could be five weeks to nine months. The, it remains arrested or dormant in tissues for as long as nine months. Whereas in case of Nicotar, it is slightly shorter, about seven weeks, so about two, two, two months, or about one and a half months. Effects of the disease, in individual, it causes chronic blood loss, iron deficiency, and shall I again emphasize that the mother and the children who require a lot of iron and a lot of energy because they're either growing or they're either pregnant or lactating. They are the people who are most affected. In the in case of the community, it affects the economy because a lot of productive years of life is lost and quality of life is lost. Nutrition, growth and development, work and productivity, and medical care costs, which are added to all this, are the three areas where the community is affected. Nutrition, growth and development, work and productivity, and medical care costs. They're all interlinked and they all form a vicious cycle. From hook, we come down to round, and that is ascariasis. Any infection of the intestinal tract caused by ascaris lumbricoides and clinically manifested by uh, vague symptoms of nausea, abdominal pain, and cough is ascariasis. Live worms passed in stool, sorry, the spelling of stool is wrong, stool or vomit, and occasional uh, in case these worms are too many in number, they may cause even intestinal obstruction. They migrate to the peritoneal cavity and cause havoc. They are cosmopolitan in distribution. And the most common helminthing infection in India or the world is ascariasis. It is seen among the school going and the preschool children. Ep epidemiological determinants, agent is ascaris lumbricoides, lives in human of small intestine like the previous ones. The males are again shorter here and the females are longer. But if you see the nicator and the ankylostoma were in millimeters, whereas this worm is in centimeters. Just imagine the length of Ascariasis lumbricoides in your tummy. And it lays 2.4 lakh eggs per day, not in thousands. Ascariasis doesn't deal in thousands. The eggs are there in the soil. They get embryonated to become infective in two to three weeks, and they are ingested by man. In the body, the eggs hatch in the small intestine, and the larva penetrate the gut, and the blood carries it to the liver and the lungs, where they molt twice. In the previous case, the molting happened in the soil, whereas in this case, the molting happens in the lungs. And they break through the alveoli and the bronchioles. They are again cuffed up and reach your 
small intestine. So the last part of the life cycle remains the same, but the larva to become infective, it requires to reach your lungs through the, uh, uh, through the gut, from where the bloodstream carries it, okay? Reservoir is again man, infective period, uh, material is feces with the eggs, period of communicability is until all fertile eggs are destroyed, the stool and the stool is negative, that is for a long, long time. Host factors, agents, age, children are mostly affected, nutrition, it obviously, like the previous worm, robs man of his nutrition. Malnutrition is caused, leading the child to have growth retardation, and it may compete for vitamin A in the intestine. Host parasite, parasite tolerance, is, tolerance is of high degree, which, which is, I repeat, that in spite of having ascariasis, people don't show signs and symptoms, and they transmit the disease through their stools. Environment factors are almost the same, and the human habits, which also cause the spread of disease. Mode of transmission, it is not through the skin like the uh, hookworms, uh, it is through the fecal oral route. Incubation period is about 18 days to few weeks, so it is slightly or it is much lower than the uh, hookworm disease. And the related number of worms harbored causes, the more number of worms you harbor, the more severe the disease. Light infection, as I told you, the host parasite balance, there is no symptom. Whereas in heavy infection, there is diarrhea, abdominal pain, malaise, weakness. This is because there are more than 50,000 eggs per gram of stool. And that is what is labeled as heavy infection by the WHO. When the larva migrate from the liver, lungs, or to your small intestine, they cause fever, cough, sputum, asthma, skin rash, eosinophilia. That's why in many cases of worms, we also give eosinophilia treatment. Adults aggregate masses, and these masses are called as volvulus. In case there are too many adults in your small in intestine, then they cause a volvulus, which leads to intestinal obstruction or intersusception. It may warrant surgery, and cases have happened. There is something called as a wandering worm that may cause perforation in the ileocecal region, block your common bile duct, and may come out in the vomitus. So it is not as harmless as we think it to be. And lastly, among the soil transmitted helminths, we come to whipworm. This is the third common helminthic infection. About 450 million are affected, mostly seen in, again, countries which are not very well developed, but also sometimes seen in developed countries like the US and some in the South Americas. It's heavy infection, could be acute but, and cause diarrhea and anemia. Chronic infection, as in the other worms, causes growth retardation and impaired development. The epidemiological determinants, it lives in the large intestine. The males and the females are almost of the same length in this case. The female produces about 200 to 10,000 eggs per day for more than five years. Embryonization takes about three weeks. They can survive in cold temperatures, but not desiccation. Reservoir is man. Infective material is feces with eggs. Eggs hatch in small intestine. Larva emerges, penetrates the villi, and develops for a week. So there is no lung or the blood involved in this case. Incubation period, it varies from about two to three months. Ma'am, I'll take just one more minute. Effects. Majority are mild or asymptomatic cases and causes epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, distension, flatulence, and weight loss. The moderate infection, as I said before, causes growth deficit and anemia. In case you have severe whipworm infection, there is chronic diarrhea, could be dysentery, which leads to dehydration, rectal prolapse, obstruction, and hypoproteinemia. Of course, iron deficiency, anemia, and all that is common with all the worms. Lastly, coming to prevention and control, which is a common thing for all the three worms, sanitary disposal of night soil, which we have talked about in the chapter on environment, safe drinking water or portable drinking water, food hygiene habits, health education for use of sanitary latrines, personal hygiene, wearing protective footwear when you're especially involved in farming, wear gumboots or when you're wading through mud or clay, make, making use of health facilities for diagnosis and treatment. In case secondary or secondary prevention, which is treatment is required, we deal with 
certain important drugs like albendazole, mebendazole, levamazole, or parental palm oil. All these are given in different doses and they have broad spectrum anti helminthics right? Treatment of anemia and other complications has to be separate. We have to give iron folic acid. And as far as the WHO is concerned, periodic treatment without previous diagnosis of high risk endemic areas is warranted, especially in preschool, school aged, women of reproductive age group, adults in high risk occupation, especially people who walk, who walk barefoot, right? We have an integrate, we have integrated it with child health or supplementation programs for preschool or with school health programs. You will all recollect that we have a deworming day, sometimes twice in a year, where we give deworming tablets to all school going children. The target is that we need to el eliminate morbidity by about 2020. So to summarize, we have covered food poisoning, basically five types of food poisoning today. And then we came down to soil transmitted helminths where we discussed hookworms, ascariasis, and we discussed lastly the waveforms. In the next class, we will finish the intestinal uh, uh, infections that are only two left, giardiasis and uh, uh, drachenculiasis, which are very short uh, lessons, and we switch over to the next one, uh, which is probably zoonosis or something else. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This